kick this off. So hello, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Evenings with Artifacts. I've lost count what week we're in, but we are here and happy to see you. I'm actually coming to you from Miami today instead of Austin. I'm co-founder of Artifacts, Ellen Goodwin. Joining me tonight, Heather Nickerson, our co-founder and CEO. Heather, say hello so they see you. Good evening, everyone. I'm coming uh, tonight from Philadelphia instead of Washington, D.C. So we are on the road, but still doing Evenings with Artifacts. And thank you all for joining us. It's my pleasure to welcome Allison Shields to Evenings with Artifacts. If you read her bio on the Zoom invite, you know that while she grew up in Santa Fe, New Mexico, like many of us, many of us with passions for history, art, travel, she spent a year and a half in Italy falling in love with architecture and design. Who can blame her? Um, she did formalize that at university. She earned a master's in interior architecture from UCLA before starting her own design company back in 2018. And we were drawn to Allison for a number of reasons, including her very direct tie between storytelling and design and how even the natural objects we collect and accumulate in life play into the physical experiences of our homes and our spaces. So we couldn't wait to bring her here. She's here. Say hello, Allison. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me, Ellen and Heather. It's our pleasure. We're, we're going to kick it off. Um, you know, Allison, we've had the opportunity to talk and folks, uh, Heather's going to pop into the chat. You know, we did include Allison in a piece earlier, a few months ago called Show Me the Favorite Moment in Your House. And that idea actually came directly from Allison. And Allison, if you might, I thought we'd actually start just with that very concept and then backwards walk our way into what you're working on right now. Okay, great. So yes, that came up in our interview over the summer. And it was from a story that I told you about uh, a friend of a friend coming over to my house for the first time when I lived in a really tiny little apartment in Santa Monica. And I it was before I had started my design firm, it was before I'd gone into a master's program. And I had taken so much pride in putting together my house. And it brought me so much joy so that when people came over, I think it was kind of a constant noticing that I really was in that mode. And so she came up to me at one point and she said, I see that you were like really curated your space here. Can you show me the favorite moment of your house? And I'd never thought about that before. And I thought it was such a sweet moment. So I, I stood there with her for a little while and I was like, oh, gosh, let me think about it. And I ended up kind of taking her on a little bit more of a tour because I couldn't really just find my one favorite moment. But it was such a sweet moment for me because it was somebody who's coming into my space and who was genuinely interested and wanted to hear the story and where I'd found this or how I came across that or what that meant to me. And I, that was probably kind of a, a catalyst moment for me of the storytelling behind space and how important it is for me as a designer to be able to incorporate that for my clients so that when you go into someone's house or if you go into one of the hotels that I'm doing right now, that it isn't just going into a space, that you really feel something and that there is a connection for that client to either the client themselves or the people using that space that's more of an experience and, and has a story to it. So I think that was actually probably a moment that was very influential to me then going and getting my master's degree. Ah, but that, that we did talk about, so I'm actually gonna cheat and make everyone go back a step further because that whole background, your research, your experience with looking at objects and their relevance over time is another great theme. So why don't we, why don't we go there and, and, and you can tell us a little bit about some cool stories from history and the relevance of objects. We're very object focused, obviously, at Artifacts, but you are as a designer as well. So why don't we take a trip back with you in that way? Yes. So when you emailed me maybe about a month ago and asked me if I wanted to participate in this with you, and I'm so honored that you did, and I'm certainly not a historian or an expert, but I really love what I do and I love talking about what I do. So thank you so much for having me again. Um, the minute that you said, you know, maybe one of the prompts that we could talk about on your evening is the historical significance of objects and maybe bringing in some more of my formal training from my master's program. And my gosh, that's such a huge, enormous subject that we could spend years talking about. And I certainly took my fair share of art history in both my undergrad and then in each semester of my master's program. Um, but when you said that to me, I actually was taken 
away from my more formal training um, and anything that I learned in school and was reminded of a book that I read when I was in school called At Home by Bill Bryson, which is still one of my favorite books of all time. I listen to his audiobook when I have nothing to do and I just want it on in the background. And he's such an incredible historian and he goes on so many amazing stories and tangents and has such great sense of humor as well. So I love listening to him and I hardly retain any of it, honestly. Like I've probably listened to that <laughs> book like 150 times and I can tell you very few instances in the book itself. But one thing that I'm constantly reminded of is this story of Utsi, the Iceman. So in 1991, two hikers were in the Alps and they came across this body protruding from the snow. And they went to a great distance to go and get the authorities thinking like, you know, maybe it had been a murder or something. And it turns out it hadn't been and archaeologists were soon called to the site. And they uncovered this incredible um, body of Utsi, who is a primitive man um, who died over 5,000 years ago. And it's such an amazing moment because he was, he, he must have died that day. I think they said by a bow in, a bow in his back. And whoever killed him didn't go and rob him of his things for some reason. So he has been perfectly preserved in ice this long afterwards, completely clothed with probably all of his worldly possessions. And he is our greatest, um, oldest artifact of, to bring it in, artifact of mankind and objects and how looking at this man, then you see, I, I made a list of the things that he's carrying with him. So he has a copper ax and a sheath, flint knives and miscellaneous small tools, um, arrows and quiver, a backpack made of hazelwood and larchwood, shoes, amazing, really awesome shoes that apparently the historian says um, reminded them of bird's nests. So <laughs> the clothing in and of itself is another whole story and people <laughs> definitely read this book and listen to this chapter. But his shoes, his clothing, he was carrying berries, a piece of ibex meat, two lumps of birch fungus, uh, two birch bark canisters, and one of them held embers wrapped in maple leaves to make fire. Wow. And he, he was just perfectly intact. So we've never seen an older example of this and things that we never even thought of existed, existed. And as Bill Bryson at one point said, it's the material equivalent of time travel. So I just love this example because I'm personally obsessed with incorporating natural elements in my design. And I'm that weirdo in my family that everybody makes fun of because when we go back to Norfolk, to the beach where my dad grew up in England, there are these amazing rocks that have big blue spots on them and holes. And I come back with a backpack full of these rocks and they exist, you know, almost like in a shrine manner at my house as just rocks and people come over and they're like, what are these weird rocks that you have? And, and they've come a very long distance, you know, like they were very important to me. They still are. So I unfortunately am in the middle of packing and moving and renovating my house. And I wasn't able to get any of these to show you guys, but that's a little example of um, just one of my interests of being a designer and, and constantly looking for things for treasures. I'm always on the treasure hunt and especially for natural items. So I love this story of Utsi and um, how intimately, how intimate he was with those objects. They were so important to him. They were his survival and they were probably everything he owned in the world. And before man you know, sat down and, and became home dwellers, these were the things that we had to have with us to survive. So then when you look at man, when we've you know, actually made homes and can accumulate stuff, then the story shifts a little bit. And I think it's really interesting for me today to be a designer because on the one hand, it's, it's easier. And on the one hand, it's harder. There are so many choices. It's so easy to become overwhelmed. And I think as a consumer as well, it's that overwhelm is very real. And some people don't really care and they'll just fill their homes with things from Ikea or just click and ship and arrives on their doorstep the next day. Other people who really do care about design and who are very overwhelmed are the perfect client of people who come to me and are like, help me figure out what I'm trying to say here with my space. I know what I like, but I have so many options and I can't figure it out. Um, so on the one hand, it's cool because you know, with a click, you can get something from China delivered on your doorstep the next day. And it could be anything from a piece of plastic, which means really nothing, to a beautiful 
a historical artifact, something of great value and everything there in between. So it's, it's an interesting time to be alive and with the wealth that we have and the accessibility that we have. But I think my main goal when I'm working with somebody is to really try to narrow it down and focus on the essentials. Like what is it when you walk into your space, kind of going back to that original story, what brings you the most joy? What is your favorite moment of your house? Or if you haven't really quite figured out how to curate that yet, what is your favorite thing? And then I can help you curate that. Um, if that makes and sense. And I think that, you know, Allison, I wish I was at my home while we were talking because I have a jar of accumulated, not taken, uh, sand from white sands. It's very important because you're not supposed to take things from national parks, but it took me, right? It was in my shoes. It was in my car and I have a, a vessel of white sand, right? And I also have rocks. I have rocks hidden in my planter. I have rocks on my shelves. Um, I have larger ones that terrify my husband in our uh, along our driveway in our planter. When we were in Colorado, I like jumped out of the car because I saw these when we were horseback riding and they're beautiful and I took a few, um, but they were huge. And he's like, why are you taking boulders? But I, I, I kind of identify with that. And I love, I love that this is very central to what you're saying, which is like, what brings you joy? But when people come into my home, it's a huge part of it right? Everyone asked me about the jar of sand. They're like, and it's water soluble sand, which like defies understanding. Like, how is it water soluble? But when people come in, they're always asking me about the sand. They inevitably ask me about the rocks. I also have like toys around the house that they ask me about, but like, it, it does bring back the memories. I, I, anyway, so it's, it's a great cor corollary to what you're talking about. So I wanted to say, so where does that go then in when you're when you're on a, a job, whether it's a home or you talked about working in commercial areas like a hotel, you know, talk a little bit to us about how you approach that. Like, how do you help folks or what is your advice to folks? Like, what do you do to help harness their their attention to to what you said, what makes them happy and how do you bring that to, to life in your work? Well, it really differs client by client. Um, and I've had a really interesting gamut already in my very short career of clients. Um, I've had some who, and this was earlier on in my career, I don't really think I'd take on many clients like this moving forward, but it was an interesting experience. <laughs> I've had about three clients who wanted everything brand new. They wanted restoration hardware. They wanted crate and barrel. They wanted it to just show up. Nobody had ever seen it. Nobody had ever touched it. And it was only theirs. And that is so 100% not who I am and I'm and who I don't really want to be as a designer either. Um, and I want to go on a different tangent with that a little bit later about sustainability, if we can talk about that. Yeah, um, <laughs> what I when I'm dealing with clients, whether residential or commercial, I think the heart of it is, you know, what is your goal? What are you aiming to achieve? What is your message? What is your concept? And I see my role not as injecting my own design into somebody else's space, but being able to really be more of a translator. So give me all the language, give me all the sites, show me the visuals, show me the stuff, explain your story to me, where'd you come from? And also what, do you, what are your goals? Because obviously you've hired me as a designer to achieve something that you haven't been able to achieve yourself. Um, and then I take all of that information, digest it in some way, and then hopefully in our communication with each other, that's kind of like a song and dance that we do, then at the end of it, hopefully they have a space that they really, really love and that they want to spend time in, and that inspires them and brings them joy. Um, even for the hotel year, I mean, that the boutique hotel that I'm doing right now in Santa Fe, the owner of this hotel, who is my client, is so in love with his hotel and it's such a personal thing for him. It's not just like, oh, do my hotel. You know, it's like he wants to be involved in the process and he he wants it to really speak to the personality and to the history of what previously existed before me coming in as a designer. And it's not my job to come in and change everything as much as it is to say, OK, maybe we need to refine this and maybe it's time to maybe update this a little bit. This has gotten a little bit tired or overused and let's incorporate some of this. And so it's kind of it's just like this this really interesting communication that we have and it is a very much an intimate relationship between designer and client. And most of the time it's really fun. And it has been tricky at times, especially when you're dealing with like a, a husband and wife who have very different <laughs> ideas 
how they want things to look. Um, that can get really interesting and almost a little bit in a therapy, like a relationship with a therapist. <laughs> um, but it's usually really fun. And, and I think for me, a lot of it is the treasure hunt. Some of my earliest memories with my mom were going garage sailing at ungodly hours of the morning. And at the time, I think I hated it and I couldn't understand why she was dragging me along. And then I grow up to be an interior designer and it's my favorite thing to do. And now I have a two-year-old and that's all I want to do with him on the weekends. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, but it is, it's the treasure hunt and it's the, okay, where did this piece come from? And and what's the story behind it? And how does it make you feel? And who did you get it from? And, and you know, like, what did, what did that person think about it? And where did they get it? And it's this, like, this constant narrative. It's the story that goes along with it and the interaction, the intimacy that you have with your surroundings. Oh, we couldn't agree more. <laughs> you just wrote a commercial for us, Alison. <laughs> <laughs> no, continue. Sorry to interrupt. I mean, I think, I think that, well, so now I'll just talk a little bit about the sustainability component. Yes, so that I think is a really important role of my profession today is that um, I try my best to gear people again towards a little bit more of the treasure hunt of finding the special pieces that can be reused that so much of today is just throwing it away and starting fresh. And fair enough with some things, but I think we have a tendency as society to overuse that. And it's such a shame because, I mean, for instance, I think I sent you an email earlier, Ellen, of um, one of the pictures from my old house that I've currently been packing up. And I don't have much, I don't have any pictures of this, but I did have one picture of one of my favorite moments of my house. And it was an old cabinet that I got when I lived in Venice, California from a a guy's house, he was having a garage sale and it was kind of like off in the back and it was kind of raggedy. Like it's, it has had a life for sure, but I spotted it across his backyard and was like, well, what is that? And he's like, oh, you don't want that. You don't want that. That's so old. You don't even know. Don't even look at that. And I was like, that is what I want. How much, you know, and he almost basically gave it to me and I wouldn't let him, I paid him something for it, but it's one of my favorite <laughs> things in my house. So I think as a designer today, there is a tendon, well, I can't, I'm not going to speak in that generalization, but just for society, we like to have, we like to have things fresh and over and new. And I think the more that as a designer for curating a space and for having a client reimagine a room or, you know, an entire house or hotel to really draw back to um, you know, let's go to the flea markets together. Let's go to an estate yes. sale. And maybe this piece wasn't originally used for that, but maybe we could repurpose it for this. And not to say I want to do shabby chic. That's not my style at all, but just kind of putting a little bit more thought. And it is a little harder for sure, because I'm not just going to go on someone's website every time and, and click it and get it yeah. there. It's going to be a hunt, but it's so much more satisfying and I think it really pays off in the story and in the aesthetic and in the experience. See, now you're, it, I, I did put the photo into the chat for everyone. So you'll have to uh, click to download and view uh, to, to view it. But I think it's a great example of what you're striving for in your work and your storytelling behind the objects. I think that's great. So I think it's a really useful example here. Thank you. I think all of those pieces in there. So there's the cabinet that I got that was just basically being thrown away. There's an old millstone that I've had forever. And I found the rock sitting next to it on a walk, I think on my property in Montana. And then next to that, it's a little bit hard to tell what that is, but it's a stone fountain. So I could listen to water in my living room and, and it was, it's a little bit of a wobby sobby moment, which I, I really love. And then it's balanced with some newer handmade um, green sofas that belonged to him before I even met him. Um, so, you know, having that balance. I love it. Yeah. Old meets new. I also, it always makes me think of what, whatever happened to pop-up videos. I wish there were more of those, <laughs> you know, you could just have it pop up each of those objects in your, in your uh, photo there. That'd be fun. Um, so, you know, you, you hit on something interesting when you talked about different visions for projects. And, and I wondered when you're saying you have to go out and the 
exploration for the pieces is part of the excitement, doesn't that mean that it's really hard to put a home or a hotel together? Because the time element is unknown. Oh my gosh. I, I mean, it's, that is definitely a huge variable. And that is also probably where the balance comes into play. So not everything that I'm going to get for a client is going to be a treasure hunt, but being able to as much as possible, have that be the focus. Um, I think one of my ultimate upcoming goals is to be able to have a warehouse and be able to collect all of my treasures and then have kind of a resource to tap into for each individual project. Yeah. Um, as of right now, I don't have that. And I do go to flea markets and I have to be really careful and specific about who I'm sourcing for and what I'm sourcing for. And it makes it really complicated because in the moment I have to be able to draw on a bunch of facts of, you know, I'm looking for a bar. How big, how big can it be? And is this the right color? And what else is it going to go with? So you're really having to move and think on your feet in a different kind of way than you are doing online shopping. But I'm a terrible millennial. I hate shopping online. I'm very bad at social media. I mean, my website has been under construction for a couple of years now. I've still not got that done. I don't like being online and I don't like the experience of, of clicking something, not being able to touch it and not being able to see it and feel it and really experience it. And so that's maybe kind of like my own downfall because it makes me a little bit less, you know, like timely productive. Uh, but it goes, I think, back to like the heart of my ethos as a designer of really wanting to be a part of this story and having everything be as much as possible, again, be meaningful. Um, so when I'm sourcing for different clients, there are going to be times when, oh, you know, you have to move into the house and I, I still haven't found a bed. So let's hear five options, four options hopefully two options um, <laughs> which one do you like better like there will be some of that compromise for sure but um when i do go to flea markets i think sourcing for clients specifically for specific projects and then also um the last time that i went to round top which is one of my favorite flea markets um in austin outside of austin I was say, it's, it's near me <laughs> yes i know it's round near, top. <laughs> near neighborhood and i was supposed to be going there next week and i can't do it right now, but I'll be back in the spring. Um, I shipped back like two huge truck loads full of stuff back to Santa Fe. And some of them, I, some pieces I still have, I, I kind of have a little bit of a, of a squirrel nest that I'm able to store some things in and <laughs> hold on to for the right moment. But most of them went to their homes and, um, it's brought me so much joy being able to do that for, for clients. So two things about that, I have to say, one, ever since I've met you, I always thought you're like the U.S. version of Sabella Court, and there, she has this book, Bowerbird, and I actually artifacted it, and I, I put it into the chat because it is so much makes me think of you. She's she's down in is Australia or New Zealand, I forget, um, but she has a philosophy that reminds me of yours very much, but but with a slightly different um, twist, but I, I put it into chat for folks because it's just, it, it's something about the meaning behind the objects that resonates in the context that you bring them into. I was curious when you go somewhere like Big Top, and we've actually had people um, ask us about this or talk about it. I think I think my parents are even listening, but my mother, even when I artifacted with her, some of the objects she said, I don't know, I got it at a garage sale or you know, estate sale or something. And I was like, okay, but that's still interesting. It came from a specific home in a specific place, you know, kind of thing. And so I found that interesting. But when you're at somewhere like Big Tap, are you able often to get the stories or do the vendors, are they detached from the stories and their collectors? No, and actually I'm so glad that you brought that up because I'm hoping that I can just run over here and get it. Um, let me just see if this yeah, is run. where it's supposed to sit. Hold on. Okay, this isn't the first time our speakers run off. Last, if anyone joined us for Rodney Brissell, he also did, um, but he also came back. So we can take a quick pause and admire this great chair that she's sitting in. Oh, oh yeah. A piece Rita of art, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm currently at my parents' house because my house is being renovated and I don't have internet service. So I'm, I'm doing this. <laughs> um, so this last time I was in Round Top um, in the spring, I came across a collection of glove molds. Um, so there were like probably, I want to say 300 of these and they're different shapes. I should probably get a couple of them. They're all different shapes. Um, some are more of this silvery tone. Some of them are a little bit more of a coppery tone. 
And this man just had them sitting out on one of his tables outside of his store. And I mean, tons of them and nobody was looking at them. Like everybody's just passing them by as like a table full of junk. And immediately I'm like, <laughs> what is on this table? What are these? So I walked up to this table and, you know, I'm starting to pick out some of my favorites and thinking like, what am I going to do with these? And I got a, a whole collection of these and I'm going to, I'm going to make stands for them and I'm going to put them on bookshelves in the hotel rooms. Um, and of course, I'm going to keep a couple for me. I'm obsessed with them. <laughs> so Finders keepers. <laughs> and I made friends with the owner of the, sh of the store. And I said, you know, what, what are these? I assume that they're glove molds, um, but what's the story? And he said, oh yeah, I, you know, I go to auctions all across the U.S. And I got these from a factory in Chicago that was closing down after like 400 years. And it had been a family owned company forever. And they finally were just going out of business. And as a way to recoup some of, you know, some more money the the great 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 grandson was selling off all of the molds and whatever machinery he could and he was like you know I don't I didn't know what to do with them but I just liked them so much so I bought the whole factory's worth <laughs> <laughs> why not <laughs> so I bought I think probably about 30 of them and I love them. I mean, I'm having a hard time deciding which ones I'm going to be able to let go. Like I, I love them so much. And I find that happens a lot. Like I get a little bit attached to some of these things, um, but I'm, I'm putting them where they need to be going. So that may be too much stuff in my life. I think it's brilliant. And I think it'll be interesting too. Like, you know, the, the artifacts co-founder in me is, is thinking um, when I'm at the hotel, I'd love to know what those things are on my bookshelf in my hotel room. <laughs> so, you know, how are you going to convey totally. that to the person? That, that's really and interesting. And it's not just something that I got at, you know, Pier 1. Like, I didn't, exactly. and not every single room is going to be the same. They're going to have variation and some will have something else on the bookshelf, but yes. yeah, that they are unique. You know, you could actually do a whole Chicago, I was just thinking you could do a whole Chicago hotel room theme because even in my own artifacts, there's a family harp um, that came from Chicago. There's a, a really cool set. Uh, I have two of them, muffin tins that came from Echo from Chicago. Like Chicago has some really cool, oh, oh, and of course typewriters, you know, some of the original travel typewriters for journalists. Chicago. So I was actually thinking there could be this whole like Chicago themes uh, <laughs> hotel room where it's just treasures of Chicago that are, are harvested and, and on display. Um, totally. So history in that side of the country. Exactly. Exactly. There's a lot there to, to uh, bring to light. Um, one thing, you know, so I wanted to share it. So I made this new friend recently. I was at a conference earlier this week in Denver and he shared with me a few articles that he's published. And one of them, I, I, I actually sent it to you. So I did cheat, Allison. So you have a little bit of warning, but I didn't tell you I was going to bring it up. Um, he met Steve Wozniak, who's co-founder of Apple. And they were having this discussion about like how scent it plays into a space and creates part of the ambiance. And, and he said that, you know, he commented on the, the idea of emptiness in design and how mental clarity was related to emptiness and having the freedom of thought. And it made me think of you of like, you know, beyond the homes of minimalists, like we have stuff, like obviously we all have stuff. Our homes aren't empty. And, and, and you, you with the storytelling, and I was thinking about this, this tension between empty and, and clarity of thought and the dilemma of, you know, the home and the reality of, of having a lot of stuff. And, and you talk too about like husbands and wives, for example, might have different versions of what they want, not just aesthetic, but like, even maybe like how sparse or full. And I think my co-founder probably has some feelings about this herself, but you know, I wonder like, what are your insights from working with people or friends maybe, or clients of like a lot of stuff versus less. And like, how do you travel and navigate and how do you tell people, help people navigate through that? Okay, great question. So um, two stories. One is I recently when I was back in Montana, I was at a friend's house and she is a pretty well-known painter um, in her 70s, lovely lady. And her entire house, it kind of reminds me of the Royal Tenant House. There's so much stuff there. And <laughs> every surface has there's a painting on the wall. And I walk into her house and I'm actually not overwhelmed. Um, I end up kind of facing out whatever is actually happening because I'm just so into what's going on in the space and looking at different things and, and kind of immersing myself in the stuff. 
And every time I go there, I find something new that I hadn't noticed before. And one of the things that I notice every time, though, is her rock collection of these kind of like long pencil, like um, like fat pencil, like rocks that she's clearly collected her whole life. And she has them arranged in such a cool, like accordion kind of way on a windowsill. And I constantly find myself going over there and looking at all these rocks, but, you know, her <laughs> paintings, her textiles, her whatever it is. Um, but I think... Then I have another friend who is lives in Santa Fe, and I, recently I went over to her house, and she said, you know, my space is just not working, and I don't have the budget right now to buy new stuff. I don't want to buy more furniture. I don't want to change anything out. Can you help me make this work? And we spent a little bit of time in her living room, and we just rearranged the furniture, and it completely changed her relationship to her house, and it gave a whole new fresh life to her space, and she's so happy now. She's like, oh, I can't believe I didn't do that from the beginning. Like, thank you so much. <laughs> So I think for me, again, it goes back to that whole being the translator as a designer. I'm not there to tell anybody, essentially, you know, like you have too much stuff or you don't have enough stuff. I'm there to say, like, what brings you joy? Like, how do you want to express yourself in your life, in your house, in your space? So if that means you have a painting on every wall, then you should have that because it's your house. Um, I think I try my best to curate it to a little bit, you know, if it's somebody who is a lot and likes a lot of stuff to maybe weed out the stuff that doesn't have the story. So like this random pile of things over here, that's just clutter. Like, let's get rid of that because it's actually taking away from these beautiful paintings on the wall and these textiles that are folded and it's just stuff and you don't care about that. And you've probably not even noticed that it's sitting there, honestly, because it's been there for so long, but I'm noticing. So let's just take that out. Like those kind of little adjustments, they really do make a huge difference. Um, and again, I'm not there to tell somebody how they should live as much as I'm there to say, okay, you know, like, let's just try this. And how does that feel? And do you like it more or do you like it less? If you like it less, let's change it back. You know, Allison, I think everybody should artifact before you come into their homes because it would help you know what matters. <laughs> and to that point, there's actually a question in the chat. It's a doozy. <laughs> so a pilot wants to know how to decorate. He has a parachute recovered from his plane after it crashed. Uh, everyone's alive. That's good. Um, <laughs> have you ever worked with a parachute or do you have any brilliant ideas of how you could incorporate a parachute, whether it's more of a minimalist type of home or, or a jam-packed one, but maybe a minimalist type of home? How do you even at something like a parachute? Yes. Okay. So this is so funny. When I lived in um, Playa del Rey, when I was going to Loyola Marymount for my undergrad, I was, I traveled to New York and I had gone to the Met, I think, and seen an exhibit on costumes. And I loved it so much that I went into the gift shop and I bought the book and sitting on the airplane on the way back, I was struck by a dress that kind of had like stars on it and it had, it was a lot, there was a lot going on. It was a ball gown. And I went home and was so inspired that I went to downtown LA. I got tons and tons of yards of Dupioni silk, which is a silk that has two faces to it. So from one angle, it looks purple in my case. And on the other angle, it looks a little bit more gold. So it has that, that really interesting lustrous quality to it. And I sewed, which I'm not particularly good at, but I was so into this project. I sewed this whole thing that then I, I staple gunned um, Christmas tree lights to my ceiling. And this was in my bedroom of like an apartment by the way. I stapled and, um, Christmas tree lights to the ceiling, crazy in a crazy pattern like stars. And then I staple gunned this circular, almost like a parachute thing that I had sewn up to the sides and I brought it to the middle and I hung things from the middle like chandelier to kind of it wasn't a chandelier it was a like cheap apartment but whatever like this for lighting and I made this like really ethereal cloud like galactic moment for my room so that's probably a little bit intense <laughs> for, that's for the <laughs> I'm like this is very dramatic and cool because I actually think ceilings are one of the most underutilized spaces I'm always looking at my ceiling I'm like I know I could do something with that <laughs> 
hundred percent. And it meant that I didn't have to turn on that gross, horrible light yeah. fixture in the middle of my room. Instead, I just plugged in the Christmas tree lights and the whole room glowed. And I was obsessed with my bedroom. I just, everybody that came over, we would just hang out in my bedroom because it was such a cool <laughs> space. <laughs> um, so like how old were you because that could be a problem to invite everyone to your bedroom <laughs> it might not come off well I know, like 20 21 22 <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what we were really doing, but we were having a blast, just kind of like probably lying on bed looking up at this crazy thing that I'd created. Um, so not to say that that's exactly what you should do, but maybe utilizing the parachute on the ceiling and creating something more sculptural and creating depth in space. I think, like you just said, the ceiling is definitely underutilized. And one thing that I notice a lot is that um, sometimes you need that breakup of visual lines in a room to be able to really experience all of the planes, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I think that's brilliant. I love hearing that. It's it's great. Yeah, I think we all do have, I think like growing up too, again, with fair warning, I, I do think at least one of my parents is on here. Um, I saw some creative uses of things. And I think that's really cool. Like, you know, repurposing things and even I've done it in tiny ways. Like, you know, my my mother gave my father a guitar strap and I found it in a sewing room unused for like ever, I don't know, 50 years. And, and so now it's a bag strap, right? Like I love the sustainability. I love oh. the story element. And I love that, you know, they come together and, and it saves it from, you know, my brother who would just throw everything in the trash, right? So, so there's something to that, I think. Ellen, you're so hip. Honestly, I was in <laughs> Europe over there and, and mad at myself because I passed so many cool street side dealers that were selling like basically we were just talking about the guitar wrap for cute little purses. And all these girls in Italy are walking around with exactly that. And they look so <laughs> cool. So you're so ahead of your time. <laughs> I am so happy that I am so cool somewhere. <laughs> That's great because my rocks weren't doing it. I promise you. <laughs> um, but you know, for for reference, oh oh, Heather did pop into the chat. My upcycled guitar strap. I think it's lovely, and I'm glad that my mother let me steal it, or I guess my father. I don't think he had any say in it actually. Um, but anyway, it's fine. <laughs> so, um, but I have a question for you, and I know that like time is slipping from us we you've you've neatly avoided and you referenced it but avoided it so what is the favorite moment in your house not though i mean i realize your house is in boxes so this is probably cheating but if you can remember your home before boxes what is the favorite moment in your house so i'm going to take that a slight step in a different direction oh, which is um, I am currently my own client and I kind of, I guess my whole life have been, we all are our own client, but this is my first big deal renovation project. And it's been a really interesting experience. Um, I find it's been a lot easier to do this for other people than it has been for myself. I'm currently the bottleneck on quite a few decisions that I need to finally make that would be easy for me <laughs> if I'm a little bit stuck. But one of the things that I found at the very early stage of this project was a really cool, old, so heavy it takes four men to lift it with straps, marble trough sink at a convenience store in Santa Fe. And it was sitting out in literally the dirt in the yard. And it, the previous owners had been using it as a planter. And I'm gonna be using this as my, my bathroom sink. And I need to get the hole drilled. And I today went to the metal fabricator and have designed a handmade steel frame vanity for it to sit on because it is so heavy. And I need to find a beautiful mirror and some sconces. And it's going to go next to this really cool shower where I popped in a window and a dark previously space. And this bathroom is going to be, I, I just, I'm going to want to spend all my time in my bathroom. <laughs> it used to be my bedroom, now it's my bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> so if you do a home tour, eventually, you're going to somehow have to reroute everyone to this bathroom with this upcycled uh, vanity. <laughs> also very difficult. Shower together. <laughs> 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 that's superb and I think I and and but 
but there's smaller elements too, right? You talked about the rocks. And I think that's a great example of how bringing something that is, is actually family history to these rocks. I mean, you chose to lug them back across the ocean, but they have that family history component. And I think that's that for us at Artifacts is like, make sure your children know, okay, maybe not at age two, but uh, you know, later, this is where the rocks came from, right? Yes, I mean, to that point as well, I think I try to as much as possible um, hold on to important like family pieces that really do mean that means a lot to me. And these rings that I'm wearing, which are kind of maybe hard to see on zoom, Ooh. but um, they're four separate rings and I wear them every day. They belonged to my grandmother and then they belong to my mom and she passed them down to me. And they were given at specific moments in one's life of significance. So like graduation from high school, graduation from college, a really important birthday and a really important Christmas. And that's when my grandmother gave them to my mom and my mom gave them to me. And they are, I mean, if I'm running out of the house in a fire, yeah. that's what I'm taking with me. Wow. So that's your next artifact. So we'll all stay tuned because we are giving everyone your artifacts link because they can only see one public one right now, but uh, we'll look forward to that. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. So um, we have a little bit of time left and I wanted to, I wanted to actually talk about, do you mind going way back? I, I found the interesting example about ice mint. There, there was another example and I was wondering if, do you have that handy? Cause I wanted to share it with people. Cause I think what was interesting about ice Man and him being a nomad, it was about survival. And you talk about that evolution of how we're no longer at the survival here in the United States, right? This is not what our homes look like. And it's not what we're thinking about when we look around our homes. Can you give the other example? Cause I just think it's really cool context for people um, because it's what sociologists and uh, anthropologists, excuse me, are looking at. And I just thought it was really cool which what, sorry which example uh lucy from ethiopia oh yeah so Lee, yes so lucy who was found with i think nothing on her and maybe no clothes right um did is this something that we talked about briefly yesterday yes will you remind me yes uh, no so what we you were going to look into lucy's story did you find out anything more I was just oh, curious. Um, I, I've looked into Lucy in the past and I kind of forgot to do that today. That's um, okay. No, that's right. The oldest human technically that we've ever found, if, if I have that right. Um, and it was, yeah, uh, the stark contrast there is, yes, she had, I don't think anything with her when she was found. She was um, just uh, like a little bit of leathery skin and bones. Yeah. And Iceman was as well, like leathery skin and bones. And Bill Bryson talks about in the book, how the elements in the moment in which he died and how he died and where he died were so perfect that he was preserved the way that he was, because if he had been like a hundred yards to the right, he would have been crushed by a glacier and, or he, the elements had been slightly different. His whole body would have been given into saponification and you wouldn't see it. He'd just be like a, a puddle of a person. Um, um, and what's so cool about him is that he is the dogs have arrived guys <laughs> dogs. <laughs> dogs are here um is that he was so perfectly preserved and untouched and with all of the things that he was with that day which again were probably everything that he owned in the world um and that the material equivalent to time travel i always go back to that of like wow this is such a cool moment yeah. in time where we have a window and the time travel that of things that we never even thought of because we hadn't had such an old example of it yes and i really love okay so this is like you just gave me this beautiful um segue into a question that came in earlier and we talked about the emptiness and design earlier from that article with the co-founder of apple so one of the questions is is directly on point and i think this is a issue a lot of people are struggling with is, and I've actually talked to a realtor. I talked to a realtor who said during COVID, everyone learned they hate open space design because everyone was stuck at home with each other and sound and, and, and stuff was just spilling out everywhere, right? Suddenly everyone hates open spaces and realtors are like, what are we going to do? Because it's that's everything that's available. But one of the questions in chat is how about spaces that have open ultra, you know, modern kitchens, et cetera, or other spaces? how do you incorporate upcycled items or older stuff into these modern spaces? Or are you like, is it, is it about the balance or like, is there just a no-go zone? How do you kind of compensate for that edgy modern feel? No, I think, I think it's all about the balance is that like, I, I tend to more towards a wabi-sabi kind of aesthetic for my life and bringing in a lot of natural elements to it. But if everything in my house was like wood and rock, 
that I found outside, then it would feel weird. So having kind of a balance of things that I have bought that are of normal, like today human standard to mix in with those like maybe more primitive components that I love so much is important. So having, you know, like going to a flea market and finding a really cool old cast iron sink that you use for your kitchen sink um, or a different kind of, um, let's see, different kind of like dining table even, like finding a cool old farm table that has nooks and crannies and, and places where the knife is hit a million times and there's the dip to it. Like just pieces like that where it feels super natural to have them mixed in and balanced. And I think that if, if a space is specifically only one way, I actually really don't like that. Like even walking into like a mid-century modern house, okay, if that's what they want, that's great. But I wouldn't want that to be my house. Like I like the eclectic mixture and, and old mixed with new. You know, I think it's revealing. So when we started Artifacts and we had to make every decision, like you're renovating a house, there's a lot of decisions to make. One of the decisions we had to make was what categories of objects do people have accessible to them to, to sort and assign to their objects, right? Because we're not... Sotheby's, we're not Christie's, right? We're not the MoMA, we're not any museum or anything like that. We're we're real, we're everyday stuff. And and one of the categories that Heather and I discovered we really needed in our life was nature. And so I put the link in the chat. And it's funny because nature, it can be one of two things, right? Or more even, but what comes to mind for me is like elements that you take home and maybe you shouldn't do that. Watch out if it's national parks. Um, but, <laughs> but there's also things that you can't take home. And one of them that comes to mind, someone artifacted a piece of glacier and that would melt. I mean, it's not coming home, right? But it's artifacting that element of nature and the impact it had on you and your and how you look at, at the world around you a little bit differently, having experienced it. So I think it's, you know, one of the, as I said much earlier in this in this discussion, one of the reasons we love you, Allison, is that like we're, we're somehow obsessed with nature like you are. And, and, and so we look forward to seeing a lot of your works as your website does get get up and going so that, you know, people can experience that differently. Cause I think there are a lot of people like us with more modern style homes. And we're looking for those ways to keep bringing nature into it without, you know, making other people in our homes crazy. Yeah. And I think also, obviously a really easy way to do that is just with plants. And I, I mean, having a beautiful tree in the corner and having that life in your space, as well as you know, maybe the rock from outdoor, but having something living and breathing with you as well um, is a really easy solution for that too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, though, on my profile on Artifacts, where you can read about me, I do say that one of my, I say wife and mother and cyclist and plant killer. So <laughs> the plant ideas is lovely, unless you do not have a good thumb. But um, <laughs> I just wanted to point out that John made a comment here. I wanted you to see, you know, about your connection to Wabi Sabi and the worldview on acceptance and transience and imperfection. Exactly. And I, and I wondered on something you said earlier about spaces changing and, and how, you know, you might set people up with a design that works for them, but there's also this element of it's going to change over time. And I wonder, is that a conversation you have with your clients, like how they can bring in new elements or what to watch out for? You talked about the junk piles and things like that. Is that something that comes up in your work? Mm, not really. I think um, like life is just expected to happen and the space will naturally evolve no matter how hard you try to resist that. It's just going to. Um, and I think the point at which another conversation would happen is if they're unhappy for some reason, like has something started to become stale and going back to that story of my friend in Santa Fe, she doesn't want to buy anything else. She doesn't want to do anything, you know, with money. What can she do with what she has? Rearrange your living room, give it a, like a fresh breath and vacuum. Like that will help too. just give it a nice little clean and, and take away some of that dirt and grime and it will feel like a new space in a lot of ways. I love um, it. But it feeds the sustainability. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. This is wonderful. Um, any other questions in the chat? Heather, was there anything else? Okay. Nope, I'm not seeing anything else, Ellen. I don't think so. 
Okay, super. Allison, I'm going to give you the last word. Anything that we didn't cover that we should do before we close out the evening? Um, I think we really did a good job of covering a lot. And I, I think that in closing, I would say, I think there's a way of getting really mixed up in trends as the consumer today. And if we want to have, you know, a design space, we go on to Pinterest and we're like, well, what's everybody else doing? And it's so obvious when you walk into someone's space and they have done specifically that because there is an air of authenticity and you can really feel it. Like it, there's almost not a word for it, but it's palatable. And I think as much as I can steer people away from doing that and instead of saying, you know, oh, you like the shabby chic or whatever it is in the moment, yeah, try to stay away from that and just focus on what makes you happy and what brings you joy and the things specifically that bring you joy. And if you're having a hard time with the macro, narrow it down to that one thing that you really love and kind of build from there, but stay, stay away from trends and trying to make your space look like everybody else's because we don't need that. Like I like walking into a space and really understanding who someone is like, who, what's your story? Who are you? Where'd you come from? I think that's brilliant. I just love it, Allison. Uh, one more question. It's in chat. Do you have the one question you ask people that helps them understand what they really like or want versus what they think other people want to hear or see in their home? How do you avoid that Pinterest conflict? How do you get them to really be introspective? I think the one question is what is important to you? How, how are you going to see the space? Do you want your living room to be a place where your whole family gathers? Or do you want it to be a showroom where you have a guest over for a cocktail at 5 p.m. and then they leave? How do you envision using this space? And, and again, what is really important to you? And I think that I almost don't really have to almost ask. Like it, it just becomes so apparent when you start talking to somebody. They, people will tell you what they want without you having to ask them. That's brilliant. I'm great. I'm glad <laughs> we can have a mind reading session, but you're right. I think you do come into a space and it's not like someone's going to revert into another version of themselves. You're seeing a version of themselves without the structure and training that you have to kind of bring it all together. Yeah. yeah. Allison, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. And we, we really appreciate it since you're living in boxes and without internet. So thank you for doing this. And we will, we'll be putting the recording up on YouTube. And next week, we're actually taking a, a, a sideways weave and we're going to be talking, uh, looking ahead to the holidays. This was on our minds, uh, silver, right? So people inherit silver. They, they go to, you know, like you did estate sales, things like that. You get silver. What do you do with it? How do you take care of it? Um, unique ideas for what to do with silver that you might have inherited, right? So I did talk to someone recently who has boxes and boxes of it that are family heirlooms three generations back. Like really, what can we do with this other than sell it? So we're going to talk about that next week. And everyone, thank you. And Allison, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ellen, Heather, everyone. This has been such a pleasure. Thank you, Allison. Really appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.